Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. Psalm 31, 5. Welcome to the Into Your Hand podcast with Brendan and Wesley. Today we are discussing the Sabbath School Bible Study for January 9th, 2021. This quarter is entitled Isaiah. This week's lesson is Crisis of Leadership. The memory verse this week is Isaiah 6, 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. A special thank you to Fountain View Academy for giving us permission to share their music ministry with you. Links to Fountain View Academy are in the description. God bless you all.
Heavenly Father, thank you for another beautiful week of your presence and guidance. Be with us as we listen to this study and learn from you and from Isaiah, uh, your prophet. Guide us, direct us. May we seek you completely in meekness and humbleness. Fill us with your Holy Spirit into your hand. We command our spirits. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it's a beautiful early morning. And this morning, we're starting the day off studying the Sabbath school lesson, lesson two, Crisis of Leadership. And just to repeat the Bible verse, Isaiah chapter six, verse one. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. In our first day on Sabbath's lesson, we're told the story of Confucius and what he thought were the three most important things. And he said sufficient food, sufficient weapons, and confidence of the common people. And that confidence he was referring to was in the government, in the leadership. And then someone asked him, if you didn't have one of those things, which would you give up first? And he said, weapons. And then second, he said, food, because he believed that the trust in leadership was the most important thing that a people that no longer trusts its rulers is lost indeed. This brings up an interesting point in that self-defense is essential, sustenance is essential, but what about the importance of worldly government and its alliance or its driving factor in alignment with the word of God? There are many people in leadership in the world who are not aligned with the word of God. But there are systems in place that are aligned with the word of God. There, there is a justice system, a court system, a policing system against certain crimes that are listed in the scriptures. For instance, one of the commandments is do not lie. And in almost every government in the world, there are laws against fraud. You can't get in a transaction and then cheat someone. You can't steal from someone. You can't kill someone. You can't even commit adultery. That's also illegal if you're in a marriage. You have, you are contractually obligated to your spouse. Now, some people don't think of it in that way, but it is illegal to commit adultery. There are mirrors within secular government to those things of a spiritual and biblical nature. And for those leaders that uphold those types of laws, they truly are important. So Confucius was right in that regard. But there are also governments that weigh heavy on the people, just as the Pharisees came up with all sorts of interpretations and edicts of their own, their takanot and their ma'asim, what they did and what they said, just on the whim. So too do governments do. They burden the people down with all sorts of extra laws and regulations that far exceed rationale. Not all the time, but sometimes. So we need to really value those elements of government and those that govern that are aligned with the scriptures, that hold the essential points of life that is the fabric of society together. Those things are important. And those laws that go against those types of things, like the value of life, we need to oppose those types of laws that devalue life or that allow for systems of covetousness or theft through methods of taxation, for instance. So it's a huge discussion, but we need to align ourselves first with the word of God and then have a worldview that is formed based on that word, not the other way around. We shouldn't come up with our ideas and beliefs and align ourselves with a secular world, and then try to adjust the Bible to match our worldview. It needs to be the other way around. We need to have a biblical worldview, and then look through that biblical worldview to the world around, and then come up with a set of beliefs that is in alignment with the Word. And that's difficult with a pervasive media presence 
and how much liberalism has overtaken society. Do you have anything to comment on that? I think it's an important issue to discuss and to consider. You've got some experience. What would you say about a biblical worldview? With God first, and and like you said, the Bible first, is very, very important. And, and also the idea like the Bible explains itself, I think, is lost sometimes. Uh, we need to look through scripture to scripture and, and really look at, you know, the vocabulary throughout the scriptures, the concepts throughout the scriptures, and really get an understanding that God is in charge here and that, you know, this is the Bible is first. This lesson is called crisis in leadership. And that's why we're talking about leadership, what it means to be a leader Sabbath lesson continues and says, people do indeed want strong, trustworthy leadership. It says that when a soldier was signing up for a second term of duty, the army recruiter asked why. And the person said that in civilian life, no one was in charge. And sometimes that's, you know, you you feel that way. You know, if you have a child and the parent is not in charge, a child can be kind of adrift. Children need and appreciate limits and, and bounds. I wanted to bring up something also that you brought something to my attention as you were discussing that. And that is that when we look at governments, we can look at the examples in the scriptures. And there's two examples I like to point to. One is Egypt. And when Moses came to Egypt and said it was time to go, Pharaoh was like, who is God and why should I listen to him? And that's one attitude of government that we have today. I think you would say it's kind of a atheistic government, perhaps. And, you know, that's not right. That's not the worldview that, you know, we need our leaders to have. On the other hand, we have Babylon and Rome. And these these nations were different. If you look at Daniel, you'll see two very interesting quotes in Daniel where Babylon's king, Nebuchadnezzar or, or uh, Darius, they ordered the people to worship Daniel's God and under punishment if you don't. You know, you say anything bad about Daniel's God or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God, you know, we're going to punish you. That is also wrong. God wants us to serve him at a free will. And both of these governments are wrong. And we can't go to the ballot box and try to vote for the atheistic side or the, you know, domineering force everyone to follow God side either. The scriptures to me teach like a a middle way of just stay out of it. You know, most Dan, Jesus was not interested in politics. You could argue that he's completely interested in politics and that's the leadership of heaven. Nothing to do with the Caesars or rebellion on earth. So I think we need to be careful how we which side we think we, we're supposed to be on. When to me, it seems like there's a spiritual dimension here and a right way. Maybe we shouldn't be so involved with, you know, team red or team blue or team whatever, because they're not biblically, they're not really right. I have a question though, like when we're talking about this crisis of leadership, what constitutes a great leader? What qualities do people look for in a good leader? Do you have any comments on that? Well, that depends on the realm of leadership that they're in. But in general, a leader is knowledgeable, wise, and proactive. They need to have information. They need to know how to use that information. And then they need to use that information. I think honesty, integrity, maybe enthusiastic. I think all of those would just be sidelines. I wouldn't care if a person was completely mundane and boring as as long as they had the correct information, they could use that correct information wisely, and then they did use that information wisely in the governance of the nation or the church. Now, their appeal to citizens of their nation or congregation members of their church is another thing. That's when those other types of characteristics come into play. If you have a pastor who has all of those good characteristics of leadership, but they have no enthusiasm or zeal, then 
it's harder for us to be attracted to them. But I'm speaking of just the practical elements of leadership. I would just say knowledge, wisdom, and application. They're, they're actually doing things that are rightful and good. Yeah, I understand that. I'm thinking of honesty and integrity also and such. And even if like someone is honest and maybe they have a certain level of integrity, they could still be wrong. And someone could be enthusiastic and charming and all these great qualities of a leader, but then be, you know, wrong also. So in the world today, we have so many religions, people have so many pastors they follow and, you know, people follow these people and Satan is coming, you know, the Antichrist is coming, you know, and I think Satan is going to have these qualities that people think are great leaders. You know, they're going to want to follow this guy, even with miracles and such. And I, it's going to be very difficult for a lot of people to recognize who he is. How can we distinguish, you know, a good leader from a person whose desired qualities from someone who isn't? You know, how, how do we distinguish this? What do you think about how to tell these people apart? And how do you know, Brendan, if someone is, is trustworthy? Well, I, I think your first point is... Uh probably stronger on the political realm that we need to divorce ourselves from alliances that are at best mixed bags. The red team and the blue team are so, in the U.S. political sense, the red team and the blue team are so corrupted that alignments and uh, wholehearted devotion is uh, ignorant at best and sinful at worst. There are some acts that may be righteous. There are many that are not. And we should not lend our vote to men that have proven themselves as bad leaders and against the laws of our land, namely the Constitution. Now, that's just in a a governmental uh, realm. But that has a lot of sway, not only to U.S. citizens, but to the world at large. Because it seems that things that happen in the U.S. are mirrored in other countries quite often and quite rapidly. When it comes to this current issue of the pandemic and the information dissemination from the United States and Europe, the world is adopting most of the policies and the answers that are coming out of the CDC and so on. I think we need to step it down and bring it back home. And that's, I think, really one of Satan's greatest deceptions is to keep our focus on the large scale and seeing men as saviors instead of men that should be simple and wise leaders, according to a foundational document of the Republic, they're seen as saviors, save us from COVID-19 save us from the national debt, save our economy. Uh, These men couldn't put an economy together if they had every piece in their hands, but they do have the pieces to destroy an economy through ignorance. And that, for the most part, that's what they do. So we shouldn't be putting our trust in the princes of this world, but in the King eternal. Jesus made it clear that we need to be giving those things to Caesar that belong to Caesar and those things that, to God that belong to God. And he used the illustration of whose image is on this coin. So who do you give yourself to? Whose image is stamped upon you? You are made in the likeness of God, and so you belong to God. So give yourselves wholeheartedly to God. Amen to that. We need to turn things back. We need to stop looking at this large picture just because we watch the news and we have we have valid concern. We have no valid control. And that's a point of maturity in the life of an individual that really is transformational. When you realize that no matter how much you watch the news, no matter how much you care and no matter how much you fear, none of that has any bearing on your situation. It's completely irrelevant. You will not change policy. You will not change laws, but you can change your life. 
And if you realize that the image of God is stamped upon you, and you've heard the words of the Messiah to give yourself to God because you belong to God, then your biblical worldview will shape your knowledge, your wisdom, and your action. So you're taking that leadership role that you used to project upon a government leader or someone higher up in your spiritual community, and you're bringing it back home and saying, I am yours, Lord, use me and show me your word and lead me in wisdom greater than Solomon and give me the drive and the energy to step out and to do your will each and every day to change this world. Let's move ahead to Sunday's Big lesson. For me. Do we have a Bible verse to read for Sunday? Uh, yes, on Sunday, we are directed to the story of Uzziah and his kingdom. And uh, it wants us to read Second Chronicles 26. And I'm going to read Second Chronicles 26, 16 to 22. It says, but when he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly. And he was unfaithful to the Lord, his God, for he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of the incense. Then Azariah, the priest, entered after him and with him, 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men. They opposed Uzziah the king and said unto him, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priest, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful and will have no honor from the Lord God. But Uzziah, with a censer in his hand for burning incense, was enraged. And while he was enraged with the priest, the leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord, beside the altar of incense. Azariah, Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous on his forehead, and they hurried him out of there. And he himself also hastened to get out, because the Lord had smitten him. King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death, and he lived in a separate house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah, first to last, the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, has written. So Uzziah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the fields of the graves, which belonged to the kings, for they said, he is a leper. And Jotham, his son, became king in his place. This is a very interesting study and brings up a lot of questions. The first thing is like we all get into sin by our arrogance and our lack of uh, humility and meekness. And we can see that here where like Uzziah became arrogant and proud. He began to act foolishly and corruptly. The question that comes to my mind is, how is it that Uzziah came into the temple to offer incense and was struck with leprosy, which was a sign of sin? And then David came into the temple and ate the showbread. They're not the same story. And I think it's because they represent different aspects. The, Jesus is the bread of life. And for them to eat the showbread was to eat the bread of life. And a converted heart could do that. Someone who was seeking the Lord came into the temple in a humble fashion, not with a prideful heart. And they wanted to eat the showbread, which represented Christ. And we should do that just as David, you know, just as uh, Jesus tells us at communion to eat the bread, his body. In contrast, the incense had a different meaning and was teaching a different lesson. And it was a lesson that the, the consecrated priests were to give in this temple. We saw last week in Isaiah 1 that you know these sacrifices and, and this multitude of performances were burdensome to God because it wasn't changing their hearts. And they were still, at this time, idolatrous. You know, they would they would sacrifice their bulls and rams, lay their head hands on the, the goat, and then they would go and bow to some idol on the hillside nearby. So their hearts were definitely in the wrong place and they were not understanding. And when Uzziah came in, he is corrupting the lessons of what 
the theater were to teach, and that cannot stand. And so Uzziah was struck with leprosy as a result of his pride and unconverted heart trying to do something only the priest could do. Do you have any more comments? Yeah, he took the place of the intercessor. The priest was offering the incense as uh, prayers unto the Father, as an intercession for the people's sin. And the king took that upon himself. So he superseded the system in which God had put in place for the forgiveness of sins. Right. So it's also important to note that he wasn't struck with the leprosy as soon as he did it, but he was reproved and then refused that reproof. And then the Lord immediately struck him with leprosy. And also, at least to parallel the leprosy, leprosy is when you your nerves are deadened. You can no longer feel anything. Mm. And when sin reaches its fruition, that's really the result. You may sin and feel the prick and the pain initially, but when your heart becomes hardened, you no longer feel the prick. You just feel the submission to that sin. You're so caught up in it, you're numb to holiness, and you're fully engulfed in sin. And his body was struck with leprosy as a result of what he did. And then he lived in a separate house and was excluded from the house of God after that point. Basically, he lost his position also. His son had to be the king. Right. He couldn't so judge the people. He couldn't that, do any kingly duties. That's really one of the great things about reading through the whole Bible from cover to cover. When we read about the kings, the patriarchs, the prophets, the stories of Israel, the stories of ascension and failure of God continually seeking to restore the relationship with the nation of Israel, we're given the full gamut, the full scope of humanity and realize that even those that ascend may fall and that we need to be very diligent in our relationship and stay close to the Lord. Now, Isaiah, on the other hand, allowed God's holiness to reach him, and he humbly had admitted his weakness and yearned for moral purity, which he received. So although their names are similar, the outcome was drastically different, and Isaiah was used for the Lord's work, just as we should be. Let's move ahead to Monday's lesson. Yes, let's read Isaiah 6, 1 to 4. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled as the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. This is an amazing scene. The smoke would have been a benefit to Isaiah because then he could look at God more clearly because the smoke would have kind of clouded his glory so that it didn't harm him so much. But I like how it says that he is lofty and exalted. He is like lifted up in other translations that says he's lifted up. And what comes to my mind, you know, is Christ was lifted up. There's an exaltation here and there's a saving here that is very important to realize in this imagery. Yeah, I like the quote from Prophets and Kings, page 307. As Isaiah beheld this revelation of the glory and majesty of his Lord, he was overwhelmed with a sense of the purity and holiness of God, how sharp the contrast between the matchless perfection of his creator and the sinful course of those who with himself had long been numbered among the chosen people of Israel and Judah. 
The transcendent holiness of God emphasized in Isaiah's vision is a basic aspect of his message. God is a holy God, and he demands holiness from his people, a holiness he will give to them if only they will repent, turn from their evil ways, and submit to him in faith and obedience. That's a beautiful quote. Can you quickly explain how this fits with like righteousness by faith and like the idea of legalism? Could you explain that? Because he's demanding holiness in his people. The manifestation of righteousness in God's people is and always has to start with coming to the cross of Christ and that point of repentance in which we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. And as we emphasized through these lessons, we have to receive the baptism. Baptism of water is the repentance, the dying to self and being resurrected again. Like the people of Israel went down into the Red Sea, they were taken under the water, through the water, but not drowned, and came out the other side alive. So God provided a way of escape from the slavery of Egypt, just as he provides a way of escape from the slavery to sin. Then we're in the wilderness. We receive the law of God, and we are to follow him. So does it require us to take up our cross daily and follow him? Yes. Do we have a yoke of Christ upon us? Yes. Is the Holy Spirit convicting us of sin? Yes. And through the Holy Spirit, do we have the power to overcome sin? Yes. So God has given us all that we need. We have the forgiveness. We have the way set before us. We have the conviction of what sin is. We have the law of God in our hands. We have the law of God written on our hearts, and that is the new covenant. And then we have the power of the Holy Spirit in every instance to refuse sin. We have been freed from the shackles of sin. What now lies within our realm and scope is choice and action. And so from this point on, with God, with the Holy Spirit working within us, we are to do rightly, justly, and holy things. We are to live according to the law of God. Adam and Eve took the fruit in the Garden of Eden. And when it comes to Christ coming again, if we are actively taking the fruit, if we are consciously and actively taking the fruit, we are consciously and actively sinning, knowingly, we are not acceptable in the kingdom of God. We're warned about that in the book of Hebrews. So we may fail, we may trip and fall, and we may sin. And for that, the blood of Christ covers us. But if we are in active defiance of God and actively sinning against him, we are choosing the other way. It reminds me of uh, what we read last week uh, in uh, Isaiah 5, right? Where we talk, we, God talks about that vineyard. And his answer is, what more could I have done? He's done everything he can for us. And uh, we have to do our limited part. That's right. If we've been given all the tools and all of the power from on high to overcome sin, and we don't use them, whose fault is it? Are we to blame God? It's our fault. The fault lies with us. The people in the time of Noah were given every opportunity to turn from their wicked ways and be saved. 120 years of preaching, and not a single one of them turned from their ways. Let our mere 77 years be sufficient that we align ourselves with the Word of God and follow Him wholeheartedly. The illustration of the vineyard, as we talked about uh, previously, was initially regarding the nation and the people of Israel. And they had a, a stinking righteousness. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't true. They had, they had sin within their nation and their lives that was not fulfilling the intent that God had for them. And the wall was broken down. Who now is the new tenant of the vineyard of God? Are we planting sweet grapes? Are we tending to the vines? 
we've been grafted into the promises and the requirements of the nation of Israel. Will our fruit be sweet? Will we realize that this vineyard belongs to the master? We are simply the tenants, and he's expecting us to care for this vineyard. So it's a wait. It's often in modern Christendom, people are far too dismissive of the responsibilities of Christians to faithfulness to God and promoting that in their spiritual communities. They want a simple answer. And sadly, and far too often, it seems that that answer to them is, Christ died on the cross, everything's done, I don't do anything. And that even means to them that they can even sin. It's not the case. I think that's very common in some cases. They're having trouble understanding the balance. You have some churches and ministers and evangelists talking one way. They lose sight of the grace. They don't see the love of God anymore, and they lose sight of the true process. Let's move ahead to Tuesday's lesson. Do we have a Bible text to read for Tuesday? Yes, Isaiah 6, 5 to 7. Then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. This is an amazing thing. Like Because he's in the Lord's holy presence, he is feeling sinful and unfit to be there in that presence. And the angel comes and symbolically shows him that his sins are be taken away. And they were. He was justified in his humility. And he then feels comfortable being in the presence of God because his sins have been removed. So we can see this as a small picture of the last days when we as the righteous inside the kingdom of heaven in the holy city are in God's truth and righteousness and in his presence, we feel joy and excitement and and happiness to be there and praise him. When that same exact presence fills the whole earth, it is going to be a terror to the wicked who do not want to be in that presence. They are going to feel the full weight of their sin. And so this is a small picture of that, and his sins were taken away. I like the description at the beginning of the lesson, the first paragraph. At the sanctuary, only the high priest could approach the presence of God in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, and only with a protective smoke screen of incense, or he would die. Isaiah saw the Lord even though he was not the high priest and he was not burning incense. The temple filled with smoke, reminding us of the cloud in which God's glory appeared on the Day of Atonement. Awestruck and thinking he was finished, Isaiah cried out with acknowledgment of his sin and the sin of his people, reminiscent of the high priest's confession on the Day of Atonement. And then the seraph explained through touching the prophet's lips. His guilt and sin were removed. So where did the coal come from? It came from the altar, right? Yes. So the altar of forgiveness, the coal from the altar of forgiveness touched Isaiah's lips, and he was forgiven of his sin. So this is in contrast to uh, to Uzziah, the king, who wanted to offer incense, but he was not purified. But in Isaiah's vision, his lips were purified. The angel touched his lips from the altar. And what did Isaiah do? He devoted his life to enlightening the people of the nation. He spread a holy message. That holy message begins in Isaiah 6, verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. That is the commission on Wednesday's lesson. And it's something, you know, there's even songs written about this. Are we willing to submit to the Lord and answer the same call? Right. Isaiah was called to be his representative 
to the people of Israel. And in the New Testament, one who is sent is called an apostle. So we have all been called to this great commission as followers of Christ. Just as in his vision, he was purified. He said, I am sinful. He was purified with that coal from the altar. We also were forgiven by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. That was the altar. The cross was the altar in which Christ gave his life as the atonement for our sin. And by holding on to him, we are forgiven. Christ was raised from the dead and has ascended to heaven. He continually carries the cross event with him. He is still lifted up in order to draw all people to himself at his altar. On Wednesday's lesson, it has a question dealing with this commission and to the temple. And it says for to read Hebrews 4, verse 16. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If someone were to ask you how you have found grace and mercy in your time of need, how would you respond? There have been times in my life that God has intervened and saved my life. And those points were really overwhelming to me, where he spoke directly to me in a situation that would have been the end of my life. And those points of life and death, in a physical sense, were transformational. And the realization that God exists, that God knows and sees what's happening in my life and cares enough to intervene directly were very moving. Mm. And also, when I read the word and when I speak with people and when I speak of the word, I sometimes get a sense of the Holy Spirit moving upon me and through me, in which I get to the end of a testimony, an illustration, and I look back on it and I can honestly say, I didn't think of that. So having the word inscribed on your heart is such an important thing to growing faith in that the spirit moves us exceedingly in ways that we do not expect, bringing to mind things that have been implanted by the study of the word at just the right moment and at just the right time. We read in the scriptures about the end times in which we're called to testify of our faith when we're being condemned and persecuted. It's not only in those times of persecution in which the Holy Spirit can speak through you, but even when you're speaking to others, even when you're talking with a dear friend, with a family member, or someone that you've just met, when you have your heart in line with Him and your mind is filled with His Word, it's written on your heart, then He has a great opportunity to work through you to touch the lives of others. Our lips shouldn't remain silent. We shouldn't be in fear. We should be open to testify of the greatness of God to others. Yes, let's finish this lesson here. Reading Isaiah 6, 9 to 13 finishes the chapter. And it it reads, he said, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until cities are devastated and without inhabitants, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men from afar, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet there will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning, like a paraben or an oak, whose stump remaineth when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. This is a very unique message that God gives Isaiah, that the people will not understand. And yet there's hope in that there's a remnant, there's a there's a tenth, there's a, there's, there's a percentage 
that is going to be redeemed, like Isaiah 1 that talks about the remnant has preserved the people from being destroyed as Sodom and Gomorrah, that percentage is also spoken of here as being a remnant, a portion that will keep the mission of the coming Messiah alive. Throughout the Old Testament, Satan is determined to destroy the chance for the Messiah to come. And at certain times, you see God acting to preserve that lineage, that house of David, the lineage of Abraham to Christ. Yes, that's true. There are a lot of points on Thursday's lesson that are important, this constant appeal. There are those that believe that everyone who is saved was destined to be saved individually. But God wants all people to come to him. He does not want any to perish, as it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And it's not his desire to destroy people, but to save them eternally. Christ was lifted up to call all men to the cross, to call all men to him. But we also need to realize that when people resist the love of God, that the hearts become hard. And just as Uzziah was a righteous king initially, he took it upon himself to take the role that was given to the descendants of Aaron. He took the censer in his hand, and not only that, but he also defied reproof. So when we sin, we need to be sensitive to those close to us and to the leadership of the church that may give reproof for the ways that we have wandered astray and not refuse that as Uzziah did. We should be very careful because if we do refuse that reproof, we get the type of spiritual leprosy in which we are numb to the effects of our sin. We don't realize how much it has destroyed us. So the role of a minister such as Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, or even Christ, it was to keep appealing to the people, even when they rejected the message. So are we taking that role in our lives and in our circles of influence? We need to. We need to share in the places in which we're placed. I like it in this middle section of Thursday's lesson, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them, Ezekiel 2.5. God's role and that of his servants is to give people a fair choice so that they will have adequate warning. He doesn't want us to be destroyed. He wants us to be saved. That was Christ's mission. That's always been God's intent. He's the bridegroom. We are the bride, and he loves us dearly. He wants us to be restored to him. Through this lesson and through other lessons that we've studied, I think we need to really pray for repentance. We need to pray that we re- that ourselves realize our sinful condition and and that our friends and family realize their sinful conditions and that we seek the Lord in repentance. And also, thirdly, that we should pray for courage to stand for the right and to make those decisions that glorify God and to have the courage to go on that walk. On Friday's lesson, it says that practices had become so prevalent among all classes that the few who remained true to God were often tempted to lose heart and to give way to discouragement and despair. So it's important to understand that no matter how heavy sin weighs upon us and temptation pushes us, that we always have Christ as our forgiveness, the Holy Spirit as our strength, and Christ as our intercessor with the Father. That the world around us has become dark with sin, but we are sent to this world as a light to share the word of God and the hope of the coming kingdom with his people.
to draw all men and women to the cross of Christ, to that forgiveness, so that more may be in the kingdom. Let's close this Sabbath school lesson with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can spend together studying the Sabbath school lesson. And we pray that our faith be like that of Isaiah, who realizes his sin, who confesses his sin, whose lips are touched by the coal from the altar of sacrifice. We come to your cross. We ask for forgiveness. We ask for that white robe of righteousness to cover us from sin. And we ask for the spirit that burns within. We ask for the Holy Spirit that guides us in truth and empowers us in righteousness, that we may grow and that we may know you as you truly are. May we walk forward in faith, establishing your kingdom, being righteous tenants in your vineyard. May we uphold the requirements and may we cling to the promises that you gave to Israel as we have been grafted in. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you for listening. Please click the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Bible readings taken from the NASB are copyrighted by the Lockman Foundation.